I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 56 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 056. Now, this particular episode, we have a gun of the show that, well, I could have done much better than this one, but eh, it's one that I feel, I feel like it deserves its time in the light as well. And what do I mean I could have done much better than this? I went to several gun stores this, uh, well, not this week, but today. I was going to say this week, but it's actually today. And today for me is not the same as today for you because I'm recording this on Friday. Speaking of which, I am recording this while there's a tornado outbreak. And I want to say just south, uh, southeast of Dallas. I hope everybody is safe and stay safe. And I will keep you in my prayers. So... But anyways, the gun show for this episode is the Heritage Manufacturing Rough Rider 22 Combo. Now, the Heritage Manufacturing Rough Rider 22 Combo is a throwback to a revolver I remember my parents owning. It is a the one that they owned was a single action 22 with swappable cylinders. I don't remember anything else other than that. It could have been any number of manufacturers from that time. It could have easily have been a Ruger. I don't remember. But at one point, I was feeling nostalgic, and I wanted to get a similar gun for my own collection, and, well, my criteria was I wanted a unit of decent quality, a reasonable price, and relatively easy availability. Or in other words, I wanted to be able to throw a few hundred bucks in my wallet, drive from the bank to the gun store, find the gun I wanted, shell out just a little bit of money, and walk away with the gun that I want. Well, I did just that. At that time, the only single action revolver with two cylinders I could find was this one. Now the Heritage Manufacturing Rough Rider 22 combo is a single action revolver that is capable of firing just about every 22 cartridge on the market. It can fire the 22 short, the 22 long, the 22 long rifle, the 22 CB, and the 22 magnum, all depending on which cylinder is, in, is installed into the pistol. Now when you cock it fully, you hear the famous, and in my opinion, very desirable, four clicks. Now, this particular firearm is dependable, cost-effective, versatile, and if I do say so, attractive. Now, the model on this one is, or the model number on this one is RR22MBS6AS. And that particular firearm is still produced today with that same model number. The caliber, it's officially it's 22 long rifle and 22 magnum, but there's more. It has a barrel length of six and a half inches, a capacity of six, although if you're going to carry this, Carry it with five plus one, or five, or five with one empty. I don't know where I came up with the five plus one. It shows you that I'm tired. I have been very busy today, but I'll touch on that in a moment. No, it is a single action. As far as the sights go, it's got a fiber optic front sight, adjustable rear sight. It's made from steel. It's got laminate wood grips, though. It weighs in at 33.4 ounces and has an MSRP of $329.99. Keep in mind. This is a podcast. You may download it hours, days, months, years after I release it. So that MSRP is, depending on when you download this podcast, the MSRP is more than likely going to be wrong. I always want to throw that out there just so that everybody knows. However, I'm going to run an audio clip that tells you how or how to get the show. And after that, I'm going to come back. I want to hit on some listener feedback. I want to tell you a little bit about what I was doing today. But first, we have this. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now, I got a number of emails regarding C.J. Grisham and or Open Carry Texas going on the offensive against myself, the NRA, Charles Cotton, and others. My position is this. They can say whatever they want to within reason because that's their First Amendment right. Keep in mind that within reason means that libel and slander are not protected speech and they are subject to civil actions, although that is rarely an action taken. On the same note, I, as well as others, can reply with within reason using the same means as they do. And I can also reply using my podcast, which is kind of what I've done. Now, those of us who are not a party in, or we are not a part of OCT's closed groups on Facebook, we have no way to know in, with 100% certainty of what's going on within them. 
Now we occasionally see the internal activities due to members contacting us and sharing what they observe or even sharing screen caps. And that's where this particular listener feedback comes from. I got an email. He said I could use it and I'm going to read it to you just like he sent it to me. He sent, you can call me John Jones. Feel free to share and use this email as you see fit and know that I will do everything to ensure that I cannot be tracked. I will not share screen caps with anyone because I am concerned they could be used to track me down. I am currently sitting in a coffee shop using their free Wi-Fi to connect to a proxy server while spoofing my notebook computer's MAC address. For your 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 non-computer literate people out there, the MAC address is a unique identifier every network adapter has. It's easily uh, faked. And that's what he means by spoofing is he's faking the address on his Mac, on his uh, wireless network card, or I assume his wireless network card. But he goes on. I am taking a lot more steps to ensure I am not tracked as well, but know that I have good reason to try and protect my privacy because of retaliation from OCT and other reasons. Now that's a scary thought. A member of Open Carry Texas is afraid of retaliation for contacting someone. Well, that would go well with C.J. Grisham's comment of referring to someone that contacted me about a post. He referred to them as a coward. Maybe people have a reason to be a coward. I don't know. But let's go on with the email. I am a member of Open Carry Texas, and I am in more than one of their closed groups. In one of the closed OCT groups, sorry about that, I I had to mute it real quick. But going back, in one of the closed OCT groups, several members started a post so that people could get tools and instructions to DOS your website, referring to my website. The post disappeared shortly, but one of the ranking members for that group posted to it, and he's got this in quotation marks, We cannot condone or encourage illegal activity, but we cannot stop our members from doing what everyone knows is right. You have three minutes to get everything you need from this post before it's gone. Do not let anyone know where you got it. Do not brag about it and admit nothing. End of quote. End of email. I don't know how true that is. I do know the website got flaky for a while on the day that he sent me this. And the website returned itself to normal shortly afterwards. But is that grounds to say they were trying to DOS the website? I don't know. Would OCT membership try to DOS a website because me and CJ Grisham are feuding? Well, it wouldn't be the first time people have done things in the name of Open Carry Texas or in support of C.J. Grisham because me and him were feuding, but I don't know. I don't have a screen cap to show it. I don't have anyone else emailing me about it. I can't prove anything beyond I got an email saying this. But things, you know, situations, the situation seems to show that maybe there is something there. Maybe there isn't. I don't know. However, let's move on to better things. And by better things, we got to move on to something that's not better, possibly even worse. My friend Ray that does the Pro Gun podcast with me recently was was riding his motorcycle and was clipped by a pickup. He wasn't injured. He didn't wreck the bike, but the bike took a little damage. Now, Ray asked me to take the take, or he didn't ask me. I kind of volunteered, but I was basically needing to run to Lubbock and get him parts for his motorcycle so that he could get it back on the road in time to attend a certain event with it that he was intending to, uh, that he had every intention of attending. Well, I'm not one to waste a trip to Lubbock just to get parts for something I don't even own. So I decided to hit a few gun stores and I grabbed some of my podcasting gear to take with me. I visited several gun stores and one of my favorites, the gun shack on slide, or it's not on slide, it's just off slide road south of Lubbock. You know, it was a pretty good environment there few nice toys that I really liked. Had some nice custom grips for the 1911s. I ne- and I had to get out of there before I bought some. And then I visited a few others, including the gun shack. Or not the gun shack, but I also visited Sharpshooters. Now, Sharpshooters is a, one of the largest gun stores in the area. And we'll discuss that later because I interviewed one of the... I actually interviewed one of the employees there. But you'll, you'll get all that when I run the audio. In fact, let me just go ahead and run the audio clip that tells you how to get the social media. And then I will come back and I will go into more detail on the sharpshooters visit and run the audio clip from that before I move on to the rest of our primary topic. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google Plus, And you can follow it on Instagram. 
With all those options, let's get social. As I was saying, I went into Sharpshooters Knife and Gun Exchange, and or gun, maybe it's Sharpshooters Gun and Knife Exchange. I may have it wrong in my show notes. But anyways, they're located in Lubbock, Texas, and I went in there to see what their customers have been saying on the three big issues I want to see passed. Now, when I went in, I made it very clear in the pre-interview discussion that I was not interested in the store's position. I spoke to J.D. Clay. He's the retail manager, and he was kind enough to give us a little bit of his time so that we could actually do the podcast or do an interview for the podcast. Now, Sharpshooters does have an online presence. Their website is ssguns.com. They have a Facebook page. I'll include links to both of those in my show notes. And in full disclosure, I have purchased firearms from them in the past, and I will probably continue to do so in the future. I can't say what the future holds because I don't have a crystal ball. Although, apparently, OCT seems to think I can, but that's another story. Yeah, I'm still a little irked about OCT from last week, or earlier in this week, depending on what your perspective is. Also, before I run the audio clip, I do need to say that they did not do anything to initiate this interview, and I, in fact, chose them at random as who I would do this interview with. And for the people out there that say, well, he hasn't given an FTC notice about this interview, let me go ahead and say it. There is no sponsorship or endorsement deals of any kind between sharpshooters and myself or this podcast. In all honesty, this was just me walking in, asking for somebody to interview. We did an interview, and it's done. Part of my interview process is I like to let people say who they are, who they represent. It's always important to know where somebody's coming from and... When you're taking a little bit of somebody's time from their business, it's always good to give them a little bit of a shout out. And that's why we discuss who he is and a little bit about the story before we go into the actual issues. And with that said, I'm going to go to the audio now. And then after that, we'll be back. I'm here at Sharpshooters in Lubbock, Texas. And uh, well, rather than explain the business or who it is, let me just go ahead and Ask one of the employees who they have been gracious enough to allow to talk to me to go into this. And let me ask you first, uh, would you mind telling me what what your name is and the name of the business? Yeah, I'm uh, J.D. Clay, and uh, we are Sharpshooters Knife and Gun. I'm the retail manager here at the shop, and I've uh, been here for about four and a half, going on five years now. So, righty, well, here at Sharpshooters, you all have one of the widest selections I have ever seen. Just standing here, I can see uh, logos for SIG Arms, I, a logo for Colt. I can see names for Beretta, Magnum Research, once again, Colt, Glock. I mean, just looking around, there's uh, y'all have a wide assortment of products and brand names. How far would somebody have to go to find a larger selection than what you guys have? Uh, when you canvass the area, we... Uh we're probably the largest gun store, stretching all the way from Denver, Colorado, all the way out to Dallas, Texas. Uh, we've boasting anywhere between uh, 3,800 to 4,000 guns on hand and in inventory, usually all the time. So, and that's that's just our storefront inventory. You know, that's uh, uh, that's not any of the online uh, e-commerce stuff or anything like that. So, we we do uh, have a huge selection, huge variety here. And, and usually, we tell people if we don't have it here in the store, we can probably get our hands on it. So, we got a pretty good reach. On that note, let me uh, give a disclaimer to everybody. I have been a customer here, and I have been very pleased with the service and the products I have purchased in the past, and there's no reason I intend to change that either. So, right now we have three issues currently before the Texas legislature that I'd like to discuss. One of them is House Bill 910 and Senate Bill 17. And before I go ahead and actually pose my question, I want to make it clear to the listeners that what I want to do here is I want to find out what customers are coming in and saying. I, I don't want to ask what the shop's position is simply because a business is going to do their best to remain neutral on the issue simply because taking a position can hurt the business. So we're not going to ask what the position of the business is. We're going to ask what customers are coming in and saying on the open carry issue. So with that out of the way, would you mind letting us know what customers are saying about open carry and all the other, or specifically the open carry issue right now? 
Uh, there's definitely a lot of a uh, lot of discussion in the department. You know, I, I think the Open Carry Texas has an extraordinary amount of momentum going forward, uh, especially now that you know people have signed things that need to sign and this, that, and the other, and it's passed. So, um, as far as customers having an opinion on it, we have both sides. You know, we have the uh, you know instructors even that uh, you know may or may not be against it, this, that, and the other. We have several guys on staff, employees. You know, the same thing. You know, we'll butt heads with each other in a store. It's like, well, I like it. Well, I don't. Well, this is all this. There are valid arguments to both sides of open carry. You know, it, it is definitely a double-edged sword. You know, as far as the decision is made uh, in in politics. So you have, for example, you know, a, an argument of people say that open carry, you know, makes you a target when you go into a place. But at the same time, it can also be a deterrent. And so it's a, like I said, it's a double-edged sword on that deal. And we have a lot of customers that come in, um, and they understand that, and they recognize that, and they understand that there is a time and a place for all of it. You know, whether it be uh, you're in all subs out in Matador, Texas, or you're wandering in Walgreens over here across the street. You know, there's a time and place and, and when you can carry and when you can't, when you should use discretion, when you shouldn't. They understand that, you know, and of course then you always have um, the, the people that come in and they're, they're all gung-ho for it. They're excited and they, there's more excitement there that exists just because it's, you know, momentum and movement forward, you know, in gun laws and things like that. Not necessarily open carry specifically. Alrighty, well, Lubbock, Texas is also the home of Texas Tech University, and I've attended Texas Tech University, uh, and I know that in Lubbock, campus carry is going to be a big issue, and I'm going to I want to turn the mic over. I want to get JD's uh, position on these issues, and judging from his class ring, I'm going to say he's a Texas Tech alumni himself. Uh, yeah, the the open carry, you know the does have a huge scope on a lot of this, but there is, like you said, something underlying, and that is the uh, concealed carry on campus. A lot of the arguments that revolve around the concealed carry on campus, people are, you know, they consider and they say, well, we don't want students with guns. We don't want, and that immediately translates to, we don't want kids with guns. Well, not all students are kids, you know, especially since, you I mean, you have to go through rigorous testing and everything else like that to get your CHL and be 21 anyway. You know, by the state of Texas and the rest of the world, you know, 21 years old is an adult. You know, and so classifying them as a kid simply because they're enrolled taking classes. Uh, you know, I'm finishing up and uh, 25 years old, you know, and I still get called a kid simply because I attend the university, you know, which I, I may act like one sometimes, but I don't think I am. You know, it's one of those kind of deals. Uh, and so I think a lot of it just boils down to education. You know, if the administration is educated um, and they're gone, you know, and provided information in a well thought out manner, you know, a strategic manner, then I think it could pass. I think it's something that is good as long as it's drawn up and everybody that, you know, is involved in it understands what's going on. I think it's a safe and a good decision personally. You know, of course, you're always going to have some places may not. You might, if, if 80% of your student population is against it, you probably ought to reconsider it. But I mean, if 80% of your student population is yelling that they want it, and they're all for it, then that's a different scope. You know, it's a different perspective. You have to look at it from a different side. So you always have to take a look at not only your administration, but your student body as well. If your student body is complete opposite from what the administration is saying, then you may need to realign and take a look at a few things. Well, the only other issue that I was really wanting to bring up today is what's addressed by House Bill 308, the removing of off-limits locations for license holders. And, you know, this is as a license holder myself, this is a uh, issue that strikes very close to home for me, although it's one that hasn't got that much time in the press, it hasn't got that much time even in the legislature, simply because a lot of people do not realize that this bill's out there. It's not a flagship bill, so it's not getting the pressure that campus carrier open carry are. And I'm certain, though, that you know, y'all tend to deal with instructors for the CHL program, customers that are license holders. So I'm certain y'all get feedback on that as well. So if you don't mind, would you let us know what some of the feedback y'all are getting on the removal of off-limits locations for license holders is? Okay, so on House Bill 308, you're, you're looking at removing, uh, you know, restrictions on where CHL holders can carry. Uh, I think there's restrictions in place that do make sense and there is a lot of logic and reason to it you know for example the 51 percent you know law alcohol things like that that's obviously something you don't really want to mix with firearms you know, and alcohol a lot of people do uh, a lot of people do the both you know we've i'm sure a lot of us have done it 
you know, a lot of people listening, you know, they're hunters. Yeah, well, I've had a couple beers in the deer lease. You know, that, that's something like that. Well, when you're out in public, that's a little bit different. Bars, things like that. I understand the restriction there. I have no problem with that. You know, I have no problem putting my gun in my door walking into a bar. I have no problem with that. You know, what's strange to me is places like churches, you know, places, uh, you know, hospitals uh, and things like that. Now, I'm sure the reasoning behind it is where you have, you know, high stress environments. Hospitals can be that. Hospitals can be very high stress, can be very emotional places and times for people. I understand a little bit there on the firearms. Um, I, I think a lot of that should be at the discretion, but they, you know, did the umbrella on removing that, you know, as a whole. So it just, I don't know, I, I think there's a lot involved in House Bill 308 and, and they need to make sure that things align properly before they start from just removing all of the restrictions versus a few in here and there. Again, I don't know. I don't. There's there's reasons a lot of those things are in place, and I, I think it could probably be updated. Would probably be a better word instead of just removing it. An update, updated version of the 308 bill would probably be sufficient. So. All right. Well, before I end the interview, is there anything you'd like to say to your, to the listeners of the podcast or potential customers that may uh, show an interest in your products that you sell? If there is, just go ahead and say that, and then I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah, I mean, you always want to err on the side of uh, err on the side of safety for sure. Safety is paramount. Safety safety is paramount. That's something you always gotta gotta stress to people, stress to customers, whether you're a CHL holder or not, whether you're for open carry or not. You know, uh, gun laws are in place um, because you know they, they they try to to keep people safe. This that and the other. That's that's the attempt. Well, I mean, if gun owners are, gun owners are generally safe. Um, and they exercise that, then we don't have a whole lot to worry about. And things like this open carry bill can have momentum moving forward, you know, because it's it has shown signs of uh, uh, use and purpose in society. So it just did. It, it's something that we stress very big on, you know. And you're coming in here, it's it's uh, no matter what you do, you know. I always like to end everything on you know, safety is paramount. <laughs> well, that's one thing I, I always like to end the podcast with is uh, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a, no matter how you carry it, no matter what happens in the end of the this bill that's passing, you know, carry responsibly. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it, JD, and I want to thank you for uh, being willing to do this for us. And in, you know, I'll uh, I'll throw your Facebook link and your website link into the show notes for this episode. And this episode should release uh, the Sunday. Well, we're on Friday, and it should release Sunday. You know, in the audio from that, you will notice that there is background noise because we were doing this live with their customers on the floor, with their employees on the floor, and it gave a little bit of ambience to the audio. And I enjoy doing that type of thing. We're going to we're going to do more like this. We may do person on the street interviews. We may do business interviews. I may even talk to different gun stores about featuring them and one of their products as the gun of the show. I don't know what we're going to do yet, but we'll see. So. Open carry made it through the House of Representatives, just not open carry in the form of Senate Bill 17. Now, when House Bill 910, which is the open carry bill the House passed, when House Bill 910 was in committee, it had a committee substitute that pretty much brought it 100% in line with Senate Bill 17, but it was amended on the second and third readings. Changes made during the second and third reading include nursing homes now being referenced as nursing facilities. I'm not sure what the logic on that is, but there's a reason. It was amended so that a violation of 30-06 is a Class C misdemeanor rather than the Class A it is now, unless verbal notification was given and the license holder failed to depart. In that case, it remains a Class A misdemeanor. It was also amended, and this is what the media is referring to as the Dutton Amendment, or it's actually the Dutton Amendment, but this is the one that the media is referring to but it was amended so that an officer cannot stop and demand ID for open carry alone. The bill has been engrossed to the Senate, and in my show notes I have it, I have that wrong, but it has been engrossed to the Senate, meaning it's now in the Senate's hands for them to decide if they want to vote it through as it is, ignore it, or amend it, and then send it back to the House. I don't know what they're going to do, but I'm afraid they may amend it so that the Dutton Amendment is stripped out. And the reason I'm afraid of that is, because shortly after the bill was engrossed, Representative Stickland was quoted as saying, where do you think they got the idea? After the Texas Open Carry Group Come and Take It posted, we unintentionally just got unlicensed open carry. Essentially, Come and Take It is telling people to carry illegally if this bill passes in its current form. 
and Representative Sticklin apparently gave him the idea. Now, these statements were, are seen by many to be a call to Texans to carry illegally if the bill passes as is, but they will be carrying illegally if they do. The language of the amendment is something that's key because some people have said, well, we need to look at the language closer. We need to see exactly what it says. It's actually pretty simple. There's three paragraphs. The first one says, amend House Bill 910 on the third reading by adding the following appropriately numbered section to the bill and renumbering subsequent sections of the bill accordingly. And then it has section blank period subchapter H chapter 411 government code is amended by adding Section 411.2049 to read as follows. Section 411.2049, certain investigatory stops and inquiries prohibited. A peace officer may not make an investigatory stop or other temporary detention to inquire as to whether a person possesses a handgun license solely because the person is carrying a partially or wholly visible handgun carried in a shoulder or belt holster. What does that mean? Well... That means that an officer cannot stop somebody just because the officer can see a gun or a handgun, actually. So let's look at some scenarios and see how this would affect it if it, well, let's see how it would affect it now, how it would affect it if this bill passes with the amendment, and how it would affect it if the bill passes without the Dutton Amendment. So let's take scenario one. An individual is walking along, pressing his face into the glass of different vehicles and looking into the vehicles as he encounters them. An officer sees this, walks up to the man, and at this point, we have the current, the current situation, which is no open carry, no Dutton Amendment. Officer can demand ID, do an investigatory stop, ask him what's going on, and if the guy doesn't check out, he may, the officer may have an arrest, or he may just simply scare off a potential thief. But let's take that same scenario, and let's have House Bill 910 with the Dutton Amendment Officer sees a guy who's pressing his face up against the vehicles. Officer approaches. Officer sees a handgun. The officer still demands ID because he's stopping this guy because of the suspicious activity of looking into all the vehicles. Guess what? Nothing has changed. Open carry and the Dutton Amendment have done nothing to change this. Let's move to scenario number two. A person is acting aggressive to others they meet, seemingly intent on causing a confrontation. An officer sees this, and under the current system, with no open carry, no Dutton Amendment, officer walks up, and now he demands ID because he's investigating what's going on with this guy. Does he have mental health issues? Whatever. Guess what? We bring in open carry and the Dutton Amendment, nothing changes. We bring in open carry and no Dutton Amendment, nothing changes. In fact, the officer may be a little safer if he knows this guy is open carrying if he knows this guy's armed because the guy's open carrying. Let's move on to our third scenario. A person is walking down the sidewalk, acting intoxicated. Officer sees him, approaches him, demands ID, and begins to investigate. Is this guy intoxicated or not? Nothing has changed. You bring in the 910, House Bill 910 and the Dutton Amendment, it changes nothing, except maybe the guy gets arrested for uh, carrying a firearm while intoxicated. Let's pass open carry without the Dutton Amendment. Does this change anything? No. Once again, it's just like open carry with the Dutton Amendment. Nothing has changed. But let's take a fourth scenario. You have a person walking down the street. They're walking normally. They're minding their own business. They're not doing anything suspicious. Officer sees them, and the officer allows them to go on about their way. Well, let's bring in House Bill 910, open carry with the Dutton Amendment. Officer sees them walking down the street, minding their own business. They have a handgun on them. Nothing else sticks out about them. Officer, well, can't stop them, can't inquire if they're licensed to carry, and allows them to go on their way. Nothing has changed. But let's take House Bill 910 without the Dutton Amendment. Open carry, no Dutton Amendment. Officer sees them, and because this officer's uh, superior says, okay, you're going to stop everybody you see with a gun and, and make sure they're legal, Officer approaches them. I need to see ID. Uh, person, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. Officer tells them it doesn't matter. And the person there says, well, what about the Fourth Amendment? Officer tells them Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. You got a handgun. I need to see ID. It could go different than that, but that's really what a lot of open carry activists will be trying to do 
if they are stopped just because they're open carrying. Well, let's move on to another scenario. Here we are with an open carry activist known to the officers to have had a CHL and they know that CHL was revoked. And this individual's walking down the street. Under current law, no openly carried handgun, no reason to stop them. They go on about their business. But let's take House Bill 910 with the Dutton Amendment. Officer sees them, sees an openly carried handgun, thinks, I know they had a Texas CHL revoked. I think I got grounds to investigate them. So he goes over and the, and, and the activist says, oh, I, I have a license. You do? Well, I know it's not a Texas license because I know your Texas license was revoked. And this person either produces their, an out-of-state license or they go, to, they go to jail for unlawful carry of a sidearm. Dutton Amendment does not really apply because the officer has another reason to investigate. It's not because the individual has a firearm that is wholly or partially visible as the only reason. It's because the officer knows that person does not have a Texas CHL, so he has grounds to stop them and investigate them. But let's go to another scenario, very similar to the last one. Because, well, on the last one, I left off open carry without a Dutton Amendment. It's the same as open carry with a Dutton Amendment. But the next scenario is a different story. The next scenario, we have an open carry activist known to officers to not have or be ineligible for a Texas CHL, and they're walking down the sidewalk. Under current law, they don't see anything that triggers a reason to stop them, and they go on about their business. You bring in open carry. Activist is open carrying. Officer sees him. Officer thinks, okay, I know this person does not have a CHL. I know this person's ineligible for a Texas CHL. He now has reason to stop him. Now you bring in open carry without a Dutton Amendment. Once again, the officer sees him. He has reason to stop him because he knows they're ineligible for open. He knows they're ineligible to carry openly because it's licensed carry and they're ineligible for a license or he knows they don't have one. Essentially, this bill or this amendment to this bill is there to protect the individual who is minding their own business and has no reason to be harassed by an officer who may be under orders by an anti-gun police chief. I say police chief because in Texas, it's hard to find an anti-gun sheriff. Most, if not all, the sheriffs here would not, would be ineligible for office from the viewpoint of many voters if they were anti-gun. There may be one or two that are anti-gun, but they're, they're the exception to the rule. However, there are a lot of police officers that would love, or not police officers, but police chiefs, who would love to make a political statement by harassing open carry activists in their towns. And that's wrong. That is wrong on many levels. So, my position on this bill is that the Senate should take House Bill 910 and pass it as it currently is. And they need, they need to do it exactly like it is right now, with the Dutton Amendment intact. But you know what? The Texas legislature meets every two years for 140 days. We currently have less than a quarter of that left. And in that less than a quarter of the time left for the legislature to meet, the House and the Senate really do need to conduct the business of the state. And I ask that both houses, of the, and by both houses I mean the Senate and the House of Representatives, I ask that both houses pull their heads out of their nether regions, act like adults, and get legislation passed so the governor can do his part on it. And I ask they do this instead of trying to force the House to pass legislation that the Senate has pushed so that the Senate can score points with the public by being able to brag, we voted the first bill to the House, and then we got our bill, we forced them to pass our bill. Don't try to do that. Instead, how about passing the House's version and then bragging, we voted the first bill to the House, and then when they started using delaying tactics, we took their bill and sent it to the governor. We didn't waste your time. The House did. You know what? The same thing applies to the House. Quit trying to force the Senate to pass your bills. Take their bills, pass them, send them to the governor so you can brag you got you got bills on the governor's desk before the Senate. Essentially, the position of this podcast is that the lieutenant governor and the Senate need to start passing legislation just like the Speaker of the House and the House need to start passing legislation. And they need, and whichever one starts at first, they have to force the other to play catch up out of fear of being left behind. 
Otherwise, the governor's going to have to call special sessions to get things done. And we don't want that. We don't want multiple special sessions just to get budgets and other legislation that the state needs. In fact, I don't think the governor will call one except for critical legislation. And both houses do need to pull their heads out of their nether regions and get to work instead of trying to look like they're both busy doing something while uh, goofing off and not doing anything. With that said, I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. After that, we'll hit the news and then we'll wrap the show up. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. And I am back. Well, we do have a bit of news to touch on, and I I am going to do my traditional three stories on news items, and then we'll wrap the show up. Now, the first category we got is the in defense of self and others. And this one is a heartwarming story about a Texas grandmother. A criminal walked up to her when she was in her minivan, got her to roll the window down. He was pretending to ask for directions, you see. And then he put a knife to her throat. And then the criminal soon discovered that in Texas, even grandmothers can be armed and ready to defend themselves. However, this heartwarming story does have a caveat. This is a case where the old saying, carry always or guess correctly, was proven correct because this grandmother guessed correctly. I hope that she decides to carry regularly from now on. Who knows? But she did run the little hoodlum off with her pretty little firearms, so I don't even know what kind of gun it was, but trying to make it look kind of like a fairy tale, so it's a pretty little firearm. Even the little guns are probably not the best for a grandmother to shoot. No mass to soak up the recoil. Our next two stories are in the politics category, and one of them touches on House Bill 910, and that'll be the first one I touch on here. That story has the headline, Was the legislature tricked into passing unlicensed open carry? And the answer is no. Even if the open carry group Katie and their representative Stickland say otherwise. I'm going to say that to encourage anyone to break the law is not only wrong, it can be a criminal act itself. And with that in mind, members of Come and Take It and Representative Stickland need to be careful what they say lest they face criminal charges. And our final story. Dallas County will soon do something that no other county has done until now, and that is the confiscation of firearms from people convicted of domestic violence. But there's questions, and questions held by gun rights supporters include, where does it stop? What about people with similar names to convicted abusers? What about when someone is accused of domestic violence? And building on that one, what about those who are accused falsely and never convicted? What do protection, or blah, let me get my tongue untied, What due process protections are in place for this? I don't know about you, but if they decide that there's a domestic abuser with a name similar to mine, and they decide, well, maybe it's him, and they decide to pay me a visit, it may not end well if they try to confiscate my firearms. Now, before I go, our gun of the show, I was talking about the four clicks that I like to hear. Let me let you hear them. That is the four clicks of a single-action revolver. That's possibly the best sound that any gun activist familiar with these firearms will ever hear. And one thing I'd like to point out about our gun of the show, and I didn't remember this until I actually had the gun out of the safe and in my hand, it actually has a safety on a revolver. And the safety is more or less a hammer block with a small rotating lever that rotates backwards towards the grip. That's the only real thing I don't like about this gun is the fact that it's a revolver with a safety. But every time I pick up one of my single-action revolvers, it makes me want more. Right now, because of my recent discussions with the podcast, Come and Take It, which if you're into if you're into history podcast, this is a good one because it's about Texas. It's about Texas history. And when I was a guest on their show, we did mention the Walker cult. And I'm kind of leaning towards picking up a black powder replica of a Walker cult. Or maybe... Maybe my other favorite black powder gun, a Lamatt. Hmm. The Lamatt's not a Texas design, but when you consider the large capacity for a revolver, along with the single uh, shotgun load, it's almost Texan in design. 
And yes, I use that line somewhere else. And the individual I used it with, if they're listening, will probably pick up on that. But yep, the Lamat's almost Texan. Well, I think I've rambled enough, taken up enough of your time. This episode probably be a little bit longer when I add in the audio from Sharpshooters. And I want to say thank you to Alice Tripp, Charles Cotton, to a lesser extent, Terry Holcomb and Texas Carey. I want to say thank you to all the members of the TSRA and the NRA. I want to say thank you to everybody in Texas who has contacted and asked their representatives to support House Bill 910, Senate Bill 17, along with all the other pro-gun measures. I also want to say thank you to Sharpshooters Gun and Knife or Knife and Gun Exchange. I forget which one it is. That's what I get for trying to do this without my show notes in front of me. And I also want to say thank you to J.D. Clay from Sharpshooters for giving me a little bit of his time and his company's time to talk about gun politics and, well, his business. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.